I love you. Thank you for joining us on another Zoom. This is a blessed day for me. The person I'm interviewing, I have known for a few years, but he is just an amazing man. Let me just share a little about him. It'll take a little while, but what he's done, I am so blessed just to know him. His name is Mark Rutland, PhD. Wow, <laughs> PhD. Uh, is a New York Times bestselling author. He is the executive director of the National Institute of Christian Leadership and founder of Global Servants, having served previously as the pastor of a mega church. I've been in that church and it is a mega church. Uh, and president of two universities, Rutland and his wife, Allison, have been married and in ministry together for more than 50 years. They have three children and nine, count them, grandchildren. Uh, through global servants, the Rutlands established, I love this, House of Gra Grace in Thailand and Guyana to protect tribal girls from sex trafficking. And I introduce to you Dr. Mark Rutland. This is his latest book. Isn't it a beautiful? And by the way, it's so easy reading of Kings and Prophets. Dr. Mark Rutland, good to have you. You're sitting where? In, in uh, Lake Mary, Florida? No, I'm in my home studio uh, at our office in Winder, Georgia. This is where Global Servants Home Office is. And we have a, our podcast studio is here. So I'm in my podcast studio in Great. Winder, Georgia. Do you like podcast? Yeah, I like it. I, I Do you, get, do you well. get interaction? Yeah, I've only been doing it for a little more than a year, but it's it's gone very well. We have a, a pretty wide readership. Uh, it's called the, the Leader's Notebook. And uh, and I, I like it. And I, I've enjoyed the I've enjoyed preparing for it, teaching it, and and the interaction on on the podcast is good. And you have seminars, right? That you enjoy doing. Yes. That's the the NICL, the National Institute of Christian Leadership. Those have gone very very well. We're I'm, I enjoy teaching it. Um, I just teach basically, Herman, every, everything that I didn't learn in formal education. <laughs> <laughs> practical, down to earth, yeah. pragmatic. All it's the nuts and bolts of leadership, not theory. Isn't it amazing? Many times students, you know, they get all these degrees in college and seminary and everything. And and when they actually have the first church, the first thing out of their mouth, they didn't teach me this. That is exactly right. It's what employers struggle with too. Is you you hire somebody out of seminary and they they have no clue of how to do anything. Yeah. So that's what I teach. Really, I, I basically just teach all the stuff nobody taught me when I was getting educated. <laughs> and you are one smart dude. And this has seven chapters. And I mean, it covers, I, I love your read. This is your, your 20th book, right? Yes, 20th book. Do you, do you, give me a little synopsis of how you create that, first chapter and so on. All right. Uh, the writing process is different for every writer, I think. Of course, you have to begin with the idea, the concept of the book. And then I, I start bouncing that around with people. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about it? Then you, I, I try to coalesce the, the concept of the book with an outline, just to see if I, a lot of guys think they have a good book and what they really have is a fairly good article. And, um, do you, do you really have the content, the substance for, for a full length book, 45 to 55,000 words. Wow. And, and I, I do the outline. I, I, I keep tweaking that. And then I try to write uh, the first chapter. And, and if I don't like it and I'm not engaged myself, by the time I write, do all of that, do the outline and write the first chapter, then I, I drop it. Really? Uh, yeah. 
if I if I don't like <laughs> if I don't like it, why would you like it? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. If but, I'm but, typing yeah. and I find myself falling asleep, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to begin this book, you got to tell this story though. You were we we're talking about the conferences you speak at or whatever, but this particular one, uh, you were lecturing at some university, and and you gave the story uh, of a revival. Uh, a Welch revival, right? And you talked about what happened in the city as a result of the revival, and you went through it. And a student raises her hand for a question, and she and she she got a little confused. Do you yeah. remember that? Sure. Yeah, it was actually undergraduates, which makes a big difference. I mean, you know, they are young. And uh, so I was lecturing on the Welch revival in the early 1900s and how it trans, I was talking about the, the cultural transformation of a revival, how the arrest records were cut in half and, and how public drunkenness was diminished and all the rest of this. And this girl, this girl raised her hand and she said, why, why, aren't, why isn't this being reported? She said, why won't the news report this? And I, I guess I had failed to mention 1905, but I thought the Welch revival was pretty famous. And I, so I was, I felt embarrassed for her and I didn't want to make it worse. So I said, well, miss, of course, this, this happened in the early 1900s. It's not happening right now. And she was just horrified. She said, well, then why are we talking about it? She said, I don't, I don't care about anything that happened in 1905. What does that have to do with my life? And so that kind of it's it is what's called chronocentricism. Uh, it means if it doesn't happen in my time, it has no it's no significance. And that that kind of chronocentricism can also bleed over into why people don't read the Old Testament. Wow. So they say, if it what is the Old Testament? What is what does Isaiah have to do with with the New Testament? So they truncate. They cut off the Old Testament and then want to concentrate on the New Testament only because that's that's old timey. What does that have to do with anything? You see what I'm saying? What you've just described is almost understandable with a lot of the university students. Yes. Because they don't like to talk about how the Constitution began and what happened and how they developed it. Uh, with you know with an open bible and on the knees praying yes. they don't, it's like that that's not relative today this is today they are ahistorical they 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 cannot make relevant application to their lives and to their time of things that didn't happen in the last 8 minutes amazing you know you you, you open my thinking on the prophets because you, you get the idea that they did not speak to power. Uh, you know, they, they gave the message, but but today we think, you know, if if only the president could read this book or if I could suggest this to the president and we, we kind of accept the fact that well, we'd never get away with that. But you cover the fact that during the prophet's time, they went right to the king and told him, Thus and so. Yeah, if, if there is a, a hackneyed phrase in contemporary vocabulary, surely it is speaking truth to power. Uh, some um, junior high school boy stands up in an English class and cusses his teacher out. And he tells himself he's speaking truth to power when he's nothing but a, just a rebellious little brat. Yes. Um, and then some, some nitwit movie star makes a cockamamie political speech at the Academy Awards, and she knows in advance that everybody in the room agrees with her. So there's no risk. But she prides herself that she's speaking truth to power. But none of that is true. You want to understand speaking truth to power. These prophets spoke to kings. They were not the presidents of republics. There's no Supreme Court that can put a check on them. There's no Constitution or Congress. The law is embodied in the king. So when you speak truth to that kind of an unlimited potentate, the risk is high. Look at John the Baptist. He spoke truth to power. He denounced Herod for his 
immoral and incestuous marriage to his own sister-in-law and got his head cut off. That's speaking truth to power. Now, today, <laughs> I'm just thinking about <laughs> the current president when I'm about to pose this question, but could you sit down with the president of the United States today and share this? Well, one would, one would have to have access. So one aspect of speaking truth to power is access. Uh, there has to be, and it's not simply the president or king. It can be um, people of phenomenal wealth or celebrity. Uh, and access to people like that is a gift of God. God gives you a gift to, to have access to those people. But it's a dangerous gift because access to those avenues of power and prosperity and celebrity are, are very seductive. So what can happen is that one gets access to the president or whomever, and in, in that avenue of, of power, one mel melts. Yeah. The, the, the opportunity to speak truth to power is there, and instead, intimidated by the secular power, one loses what that access could have provided, which was exactly what you say. To, to deal with power. Does God select prophets today? Was that during that era? And we read about it, doesn't happen today. How does that work now? That's a, that's a very good uh, question. Well, in the first place, I make a distinction between prophet, capital P, and prophet, lowercase p. So I think there are people that God raises up that speak with a prophetic voice. They speak to culture or society or a country or a specific leader, and they speak prophetically. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're prophets in the same sense that Jeremiah was a prophet. So I always used to tell the kids at the universities, just because somebody puts prophet on their business card doesn't mean they are one. <laughs> and... I, I, but I do think there are people that speak prophetically, that, that their, their words confront culture, that they, that they deal with society, and, and those are prophetic voices. If you remember in the book, I told this fascinating story uh, about the confrontation between Francis Asbury and George Washington. Did yeah. you read that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, in fact, I've got it right here to ask, but I'm glad you're going to that. Well, that, that's a prophetic voice. Francis Asbury was the head of the Methodist Church in the new country of the United States and on the frontier. John Wesley, 1785, May of 1785, uh, John Wesley sent to help him uh, a Welch physician named Thomas Coke. Coke and Asbury went to see General Washington at his home in Mount Vernon wow. and he had dinner with him. Washington wrote in his diary, last night, I entertained two gentlemen, a minister, Reverend Francis Asbury, and a physician, Dr. Thomas Koch. After dinner, they left. That's all he said. Francis Asbury wrote in his diary, last night, Dr. Koch and I had dinner at Mount Vernon with George Washington. We pleaded with him to sign our petition opposing slavery in the New Republic. Wow. And urged him to free his slaves. He declined. Wow. That's what Asbury wrote. Now, I'm certainly not saying Francis Asbury was a prophet like Ezekiel was, but that is a prophetic voice. Yes. Uh, God, God doesn't deal with us in what ifs and might have beens, but we can conjecture. What if George Washington had signed that petition? Wow. What if he had freed his slaves, 315 of them? He had 315? 315. What if he had gone to, to Thomas Jefferson and said, look, Tom, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's take the plunge. Wow. Sign this petition. You free your Jefferson, of course, was also a huge slave owner. And we'll never know, but what if they had? Now, I'm, I'm not in that school of thought that this is the founding fathers. They were great men, great men. 
but it doesn't mean they were perfect men. Yes. And this was a flaw in their worldview about, about what slavery meant. It was a flaw. They were flawed men. They were great men, but they were flawed men. You know, I'm, I'm sure the, the individuals that tear down the monuments, yeah. that if we spent time with them, they would be perfect, right? No, they're perfect. So what if, what if, they, what if those guys had, had signed that petition? and freed their slaves and gone to the other slave owners, not everybody that signed the, the uh, constitution, that not all the founding fathers were slave owners. John Adams was horrified by it. But what if they all had? And what if the 11th amendment to the constitution was the end of slavery? Then maybe less than a hundred years later, hundreds of thousands of American boys wouldn't have died on battlefields like Shiloh and Gettysburg and Appomattox. Wow. We'll never, we'll never know. But what if they had heard that? So the point is the prophetic voices through whom God speaks to a leader, a culture, a society. Um, take Dr. Martin Luther King. I, also not a perfect human being, but a, a great human being, but flawed. Okay. What if, what if God was speaking to society through him, which he was? That's a prophetic voice about the end of Jim Crow and the end of segregation. That's a prophetic voice. So there are prophetic voices who are not necessarily prophets in the sense, back to your question, in the sense that the Old Testament prophets like Elijah and Ezekiel were prophets, but they are uh, prophetic voices. Jeremiah fascinates me. Mm. Another one, right? Yes or he was given a message and he had to go into the leaders with the possibility that he could lose his life. It's one of the, one of the fascinating things uh, in, that I bring forth in the book, in my view, it's fascinating, is the access that these prophets yes. had. Yes. Uh, Elijah, who was a prophet to Israel, had huge access. He, it, one verse of scripture just says, and so he came to Damascus and dealt with the king of Syria. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that tells you everything and it tells you nothing. Yeah, that's he true. Just, they just walk in. Yeah, a shorthand. It, <laughs> <laughs> it is proof that they had, God gave them tremendous access to power. And that, that is what we need now. We need prophetic voices that have access to the highest levels of power. Have you because I've known you for some time and know your, your track record, felt the Holy Spirit leading you to speak something and you're thinking, if I say this, I've got to be sure this is God or is this Mark? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, I can't think of a time when I have said straight out, thus said the Lord. I, I just am, I'm not as confident of, of my ability to distinguish between my own thoughts, ideas, hopes, desires, and what is actually the voice of God. So what I've more often said is, as well as I can hear God, if I can hear what the Lord is saying to me, but I, but you tack, you tack thus saith the Lord onto something. That's, that's a serious business right there. And we should hold contemporary prophets, quote unquote, we should hold them responsible for people that made what they said were words of prophecy. It's different. It's one thing to make a political prediction. Yes. <clears throat> it's one thing to say what you want to happen. But when you tack on, thus saith the Lord, you have to be held accountable for that. When you watch Christian television, you can just check them off. Yes. That phrase is used all the time. I just watched one recently. I, I mentioned no names, but, but he said, after the towers went down, God told me before that happened. Now, I don't know who he told, if it's on record, <laughs> you know, or if... Or if if it was said like he explained, but was it what was interesting is he set up by saying that this meeting that he was going to have, that he was going to give 
a word that God told him at that meeting. So it's like, okay, I gave you my qualifications. Mm. I knew the towers were coming down. So you certainly would want to be at that meeting because I've got something from God. As I'm hearing this, I'm going, and then I read your book and where you said, you said that prophets uh, talking about current events, these are your words, must be held accountable. Yeah, there's that, a fast, but that doesn't happen, does it? It doesn't happen because uh, the 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 prevailing Christian culture uh, is squeamish about about really holding people accountable for things like that. We're we're too easily we're too easily bamboozled, and our emphasis upon grace, which is a good emphasis, I I, I preach grace. Yeah. But our emphasis on grace often has inhibited our ability to hold each other accountable. We just want to shrug it off and say, well, instead of saying that was a false prophecy, we want to say, well, everybody misses sometime. And that's just not simply not good enough. When you, when you use the word, thus saith the Lord, that makes it different. Well, in, in the Old Testament, if they were wrong, did they die? <laughs> well, in the Old Testament, they stone false prophets. <laughs> I'm not saying we ought to do that, Herman. I would tell you this: we wouldn't have to stone but two, <laughs> and it would it would cut out a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> we, you might as well shut down Christian television. <laughs> you know, there's a there's a fascinating story, and I, I reference it in the book about a, a false prophet named Zedekiah. Um, he, uh, Jehoshaphat, the good king of the south of Judah, and uh, Ahab, the wicked king of the north, come together in a military and political alliance, which Jehoshaphat never should have done that. Right. He never should. Always be careful with whom you form a partnership. Yes. But they're going to march out and fight a foreign army. And so Jehoshaphat must have sensed something was amiss because he said, don't we have any prophets that can tell us what's going to happen? Ahab has all this army of false prophets. He brings them in and they all say, oh, you're going to win, go out against them. And this guy named Zedekiah makes horns out of iron. And, and I guess it's an attempt to dramatize his prophecy, to make it seem more real with drama. And he puts these horns up to his head and he says, as a, as a bull would gore, you will go out and you'll gore your enemy. You're going to win. So Jehoshaphat says, the good king, Jehoshaphat, he must have had the creeps from these guys because he says, is there anybody else? So Ahab says, okay, there's this guy named Micaiah. And he doesn't like me. <laughs> he, said, he never prophesies good for me. He hates and, me. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat says, let's get him. So they bring Micaiah in. And they tell him, all these prophets say we're going to win. What do you say? And he begins to mock them. He's sarcastic. He says, oh, yeah, you're going to win 100%. These guys couldn't be wrong. Go, you're going to win. And the wicked king, Eli, uh, the wicked king Ahab says an amazing thing. He says, how many times have I told you, only tell me what God tells you to tell me? Yes. And Micaiah says, okay, you want to know what God told me? You're going to lose the battle. And not only that, you're going to be killed on the battlefield. And Ahab says, when I come back, I'm going to put you in prison. And, and listen to what Micaiah says. If you come back at all, I'm a false prophet. So true prophets want to be held accountable with what they say in God's name. Yes. They're, they're fake kings. Herod was a fake king. He wasn't even a Jew. He was an Adumian. So there are fake kings. But frankly, false prophets are more dangerous than fake kings. Be, be, because people are enamored. They trust in them. They, li they put that supernatural patina on it and claim the authority of God. You know, when I was a kid, I was taught Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I, I was taught it. It meant don't use the name of Jesus to cuss people out. Yes. Which, which, by the way, I'm opposed to that. Okay. Let's settle that. But that's not what that verse means. That verse means 
don't claim the name and authority and power of God in order to enhance your own authority for vainglorious purposes. So taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain has far more to do with false prophecy than it does with cussing people out. Never thought that. That to is the vanity. To choose his name for vanity is to, is to make me seem like a great prophet. You're using the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Which chapter, we got about two and a half minutes. Which chapter did you wrestle with? It's there in the book. You got seven of them. Yeah. But what would that be? The very first chapter. Uh, because I wanted to write a book that was relevant to today, but didn't blast anybody. I didn't want to name names. I didn't want to say, okay, this guy made a false prophecy about this election or that. But I wanted people to be able to take the book and make application. But I didn't want to lower the guns to deck level and load with grape shot. I could have done that. Yeah. I could have called people out. Yeah, you know. But that's not what I wanted. Yeah. I wanted to write a book that people would see as meaningful and relevant to today. You know what is amazing when I read books like this? 20 years from now, this is still relevant. That's what I hope for. If you, if you put names, as soon as you read the name, 10 years later, you go, oh, okay. I, okay. You, I don't, I, I know about that. Thank you. This, this kind of writing is forever. Thank you. I love to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. And, and when yeah, we didn't even get to Abraham, which was the first prophet <laughs> and he acted, he interacted with, with, with Kings Abraham. I mean, yes. and then we, we didn't talk about Moses and, and, and a God of deliverance. We talked about him, but you did say, I love, I love, the, the story of talking to George Washington. I mean, I, when I read that, I mean, I, I wrote that down at the bottom of my page here. I go, I don't want to forget that. And, okay. and this, and the Lord just led you to share that with, we have about Brooke about a minute. Yeah. Sure. Christ. I hate to do it in a minute, but somebody watching may make that decision. Yeah. The book of revelation in the 19th chapter says that the, the, the truth of all prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. All prophecy leads to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So what I would say to anybody watching or listening right now is this, Amen. turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and give him your own future, the future of the world, the future of the cosmos, that's in God's hands. Now give him your future and your eternity as well. Receive Christ as your savior. This is the voice of prophecy, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is Lord and Savior. Make him yours. And you attest to that because you have done that. Amen. Spend time in the Word of God. God bless you. Bye-bye.